Good morning. Welcome to our second panel today. Uh, when I got here in 1967, <coughs> pushing 50 years now, a panel like this could never have existed because there weren't any women sports casters or sports writers. The times, of course, have changed, and, and it was important for me today, for today, is to have a panel like this and one that really transcends generations. And so I want to introduce the panelists and then we're just going to talk for a while and, and you guys can chime in with questions whenever you want. To the far end is a, a friend of mine of, well, a few years, Diane K. Shaw, who, please. I think what happens when you're around the business long enough uh, with the perspective of the rearview mirror, you become a pioneer. And certainly Diane was and is uh, really one of the first sports columnists, women's sports columnists. And we'll ask each of them their background and why they got into doing what they're doing. I first met Allison Footer in 1999, you said? Well, we first met in 1997. 97. All right, so now going on 20 years ago. <laughs> One of the things that will always bring us together was that in, we were reminded last night, 1999, after a, a game in Houston uh, with the Astros, as in broadcasting, she was working for the Astros at the time, and we went out with a bunch of people for a beverage after the game. So that's what? 17, 18 years ago, 19 years ago, whatever it was. It was the last time I was carded. <laughs> and so Allison will always have a soft spot. I was 40 years old. For <laughs> Love you, dear. Um, Liz Schantz, you met in the uh, previous panel, who has a, a, a varied background in, in sports writing, women in sports, and how we view it and them and us. And finally, I came upon Kaylee Hartung at the recommendation of David Brofsky, who uh, will be on our panel a little bit later on uh, talking about SportsCenter, for which he was a coordinating producer for many years. And the first thing that struck me, Kaylee, you've got the biographies and the programs. Uh, <coughs> Her background was news. She worked uh, on Face the Nation with Bob Schieffer, but she wanted to be a sportscaster. And she's doing it very well with the SEC Network, among other things. So here is his 31. I'm not going to ask Diane's age, but my point is I wanted to span the spectrum of young, veteran, those in their prime, and then a perspective from Liz to put it all together. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna start with Diane. First basic question. What drew you to writing about sports? How did it come about? And you were kind of a youngin' when it all happened in a hurry. I never intended to be a sports writer. I intended to be a journalist. I always wanted to be a journalist. Um, I became a big sports fan as a, as a kid living in Chicago. Um, there was always a baseball game being telecast or broadcast in my house. And so I loved sports. But I wanted to do more than that. And what happened was I eventually got hired at Newsweek magazine as a floater. So I, I wrote for every section of the magazine. And one of the strange things I discovered was when you're a writer for a news magazine like that, uh, the writers are in New York, and the reporters are in bureaus all over the country or the world. So if I wanted to do a story about Charlie Steiner, the broadcaster for the Dodgers, I'm the writer in New York, we assign the LA Bureau to do the interview. They send me a file, and I rewrite it. And I found that there was, um, it was disconcerting because I needed to look at that person's face. I needed to ask follow-up questions that this person hadn't thought to ask. 
there was one department at Newsweek where the writer could do the reporting, and that was sports. Uh, Newsweek was a very, it was made up of a lot of intellectual people. I always <coughs> said everybody there had a double degree from Yale. I had a bachelor's from Indiana University, and I, I was in the closet. I didn't dare tell anybody that. <laughs> um, but there, was, there were two sports writers, and one left to go to another sports publication that Who Newsweek that? started called Inside Sports, Pete Bonventry. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, I think I'd like that job because at least I can get out of the office and interview people, and I do love sports. So that's how I, I got into that. And then about a year later, I was hired by the Los Angeles Herald Examiner to be a sports columnist. Now, I had never worked for a daily paper, I didn't read columns. I didn't know what columnists did. <laughs> so I, in New York, I took the uh, New York Times columnist, Dave Anderson, to lunch. And I said, what do you think? And he said, do it. So now all of a sudden, I'm a sports columnist in LA. And uh, that's where I was, you know, morning, noon, and night, it was sports. And it was great. I really enjoyed every minute of it. Did you realize that you were the one and only at the time you went to Los Angeles, not having even had a column before you or anybody else of your gender? I was told that I was the first woman in the United States to have a daily column in a, in a newspaper, or have a column in a daily newspaper. And the Herald Examiner decided to publicize this, and so suddenly every columnist now had a picture by their column. And there were posters all over LA. In fact, one day I was on the freeway driving to work and there was a city bus in front of me spewing smoke into the pollution. And across the back window was a picture of me. <laughs> read, read the you know, sports column. So yes, and um, it made me feel that I had to be good and I had to be careful not to screw up because I think that I was setting the tone that women could do these things. Allison, how did, how did you get involved growing up in Ohio? Um, well, I grew up a Reds fan in Dayton, Ohio, and went to school at the University of Cincinnati and graduate school there, too. I was a graduate assistant for the sports information department. And that was kind of my uh, introduction to the PR side of sports. Was sports the thing you always wanted to do? No, baseball was the thing. Baseball. I so, yeah. so baseball's... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. People try to talk football with me, and it's like talking a foreign language. I don't pay So real time. life was not necessarily a consideration. You were going to get into sports. Um, honestly, I went to college not really having any idea what I was going to do, and not really... I mean, just being extremely interested in just getting through it and getting it over with. So I was kind of just out there, and I wasn't great at any other subjects, but I did like writing, and... It was just a chance meeting that I went to my journalism professor because we had to write this long form magazine type uh, story. And I had absolutely no idea what to do. And so he sent me um, to the sports information office and made a call and said, give, you know, maybe you can just give her an assignment. And it ended up being an interview with one of the basketball players at the time that Bearcats had just been in the Final Four. Um, and so I wrote a story on Curtis Bostic, who was like a big star on the team. And I was so nervous that I had to ingest some beverages before I went over to his dorm. To, I can't believe I'm even telling this story. Anyway, to just get through the interview. That was and my freshman year. It's fine. <laughs> I was so nervous. And it's really funny because now we're Facebook friends. I'm like, you have no idea how much I was freaking out to do that interview. But um, So I wrote this story, and they ended up putting it on page three of the of the basketball game program um, that was sold at the games. And it was like the, it was just this wonderful thing. So anyway, they brought me on as a grad assistant. And, uh, and so for the next two years, I just got a lot of experience in, um, in all different sports. Baseball was my main thing, but I was working swimming and diving and women's soccer and women's basketball and all the football games and uh, all the basketball games, of course. Um, but I wanted to get into baseball. I wanted to at least try it before I really looked into sports information. So I went to the winter meetings, the baseball winter meetings, which were in Los Angeles that year. And it's mostly um, minor league jobs. So you basically go through this whole job fair. And uh, it's really nerve wracking. But I got a job with the AA Cleveland Indians. And that eventually led to getting a job with the Houston Astros. So I was fortunate I only had to spend one year working for a minor league team. But it got me to that next step, which was nice. Liz, I'm going to come back to you in a minute. First, I want to 
talk to Haley a little bit. You began professionally with Bob Schieffer, Face the Nation. Now you stoop to our level in doing <laughs> sports. What, when did you know this is what you wanted to be, and how did you get to Bob Schieffer and from Bob Schieffer to the SEC? Such a circuitous route for me to where I am now, and I think if you would have told me when I was sitting in the chair that any of you students are sitting in, that by the time I was 28, I needed to have a full-time staff contract with ESPN and contribute to their coverage of college football, basketball, and baseball at the highest level, I would have laughed, and I, and I, and I don't think I would have possibly been able, with that particular goal in mind, been able to get there. I probably would have screwed it up somewhere along the way. Um, I could never have charted this path, but it's been a whole lot of fun. For me, I think of myself as a storyteller first. Whether the subject matter is news or sports, that's where it all begins for me. And, and truthfully, that desire was born out of the worst day of my life. When I was 10 years old, um, my father, he was a pilot. He was killed in a plane crash in an air show in front of 30,000 people. And it was news, and it was covered as such. And I remember watching the coverage of his crash on CNN. And I didn't understand as a 10-year-old how the story of the end of his life and the worst day of my life could be told with so little regard for who he was as a person. It was just an event. It wasn't about the man who was the most important person in my life. And I remember having a conversation with my mom that day about how I wanted to give context to stories and how moments like that you needed to understand who that person was and have understanding of and respect for the people who were affected by stories of that magnitude. And that's where it all began for me. So there was a, you know, there was a time when the, the dream was the Today Show because I saw that format every morning before I was going to school and I watched Katie Couric sit down with people and interview them and get to know them better and share their stories. And the opportunity to work with Bob Schieffer was so incredible in such a matter of being at the right place at the right time and building relationships with actually alums of the small liberal arts school that I went to, Washington and Lee University in Virginia. And there was an alum who was the deputy bureau chief for CBS News in Washington, somebody I reached out to while I was looking for internships. And I asked if I could sit down with him just after graduation just to get some perspective on the landscape in the news industry and he was so kind and we had this great conversation and they said you know I really don't have a job to offer you but but I'll keep your resume on file and I thought that was just the, the kindest you know good luck to you and your resume you know like in the trash over here and two weeks later I got a call from him out of I mean oh my it's seemingly out of the blue and he just said Bob Schieffer needs a new assistant and we need a new associate producer for Face the Nation we're going to make it one job and I just gave him your resume you should give him a call and and I did and um, was in Bob's office the next day, worked for him for five years, and throughout my time with him, what was so special about him as a boss was that not only was I getting to learn from one of the absolute legends of the industry, but he basically said, you can wear as many hats as you can balance as long as you know your first responsibility is to me. So with that being said, under the umbrella of CBS News was able to earned the opportunity to have several different jobs over the course of my five years with him while I was still doing his expense reports and making his travel arrangements. But there was then a role with cbsnews.com where I was very much in the one-man band style that every journalism major now graduates with the, the skill set to do. And then came along an opportunity with CBS College Sports Network very much by way of Bob in the most wonderful and grandfatherly way, sending clips of stuff I did on cbsnews.com to the president of CBS Sports, which when I found that out, I was absolutely mortified. Very, very grateful, um, but absolutely mortified. And after two years of juggling two very different jobs in news and sports and working for most of that time seven days a week with no social life, <laughs> I, uh, the opportunity then came to audition with Longhorn Network which was, it still is, under ESPN's guidance and ownership. And, and I just dove headfirst into, into sports then. And it was, it was, people have asked so often, why, why make that choice? Why sports over news? And for me, it was a matter of momentum. It was CBS Sports was putting me on television. CBS News wasn't. And 
then ESPN came calling. So I, I dove in. And, and for me, the love for sports, the genesis of that is growing up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a place where you have to try not to be a sports fan or a more specifically an LSU fan. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was just something I grew up around and always thought was fun. And, you know, it was always nice in high school, kind of knowing what was going on, just to be able to have conversations with the boys. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a fun journey. Your early part of your career has kind of mirrored mine. My first 13 years in, in the business was in the news business. I was a, a news director at a radio station in New Haven when I was 23, went to Hartford, became news director there, and then it turned to an all-news format. Cleveland called, would you come and run our all-news station? And then I went back to New York and was a, a news director at a FM station in New York before I took the full-time plunge uh, into sports. So as soon as I heard about you and, and, and read the resume, I thought, oh, okay. So you, do you, cons you consider yourself a storyteller, a sportscaster, and to what degree does your news background help you do what you do that you do so well. <laughs> well. Thank you for that. I think that my news background was the best training for anything in this realm. It goes back to working with Bob Schieffer, who's who has the line he often uses is that journalism is best learned as an apprenticeship. You find someone who you admire, who you want to emulate, you then try to emulate them, and along the way you find your own voice. And that has very much been the process for me. And, and it's, it's always weird when I tell stories that are lessons that I learned from Bob Schieffer that he learned from Walter Cronkite. That is hard, still hard for me to wrap my mind around over the course of the past 10 years. But Bob explains that a light bulb went off for him as a journalist when he first met Walter, who was his hero, who such an icon. And he realized the first time he met Walter that Walter was exactly the same person off camera as he was on camera. So with that in mind, I do think of myself as a storyteller first and a reporter. For me, whether I'm talking about news or sports, the goal for me eventually is for it not to matter, for me to be regarded as someone who is an interesting interviewer, who is able to draw out the stories and the emotions and the motivations from people regardless of what their profession may be. Liz, as you're it's listening. Story, by the way. Oh, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> Lori. He called me Haley. It's okay. That's it's, no, it's okay. all good. It's all fact checking, right? So we're all good. <laughs> I'm back to my freshman year again. As I was saying, Lori. As you listen to Diane, Haley, um, and Allison, and. It, 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 what string of consistency do you hear in their story? And, and I'm reminded because a friend of ours, Har Harvey Arrington, used to write for the New York Times. He was interviewed not too long ago, and he said, being called a sports writer is not really fair. Nobody calls him a news writer or a movie writer. It, it, it's a writer, it's a reporter. Um, what continuity do you hear in their stories and is it a fairly consistent one throughout this industry? Yeah, well all of these women got into it the same reason that I got into it is that we loved sports and it's not unusual for women to love sports but when I was growing up I was a tomboy and you know what I owned that because that's what it was but it's more recognition now I think that women fall in love with sports the same way that men do and I feel like for I, you know, I grew up in Pittsburgh. The Steelers um, won the Super Bowl every year. The Pirates won the NL East. They all won the big thing in 1979. I thought that was the way of the world. I mean, that was, that was what I did. I, I looked to sports for fun. What did I do? I played sports. Um, not well, but I played them. So I, I don't think that's unusual. I, I get that question all the time. Well, why did you get into sports? People rarely ask men why they got into sports journalism because it's just assumed that, when, that men have an affinity for sports. I've been asked that over and over again, and I think that's gonna start to change. I don't mind being asked that, because I think one of the important things that all of us can do is say this is, you know, we're people first, we're, we're sports people, we're journalists first, and I think that that's, um, I think that's really important, and I think there should be more 
opportunities for this. It's disappointing to me that there aren't more of us, honestly. When I was in college at Penn State in the late 1980s, I was one at the student paper covering the football team on a beat, and there were two or three women in the press box on the Penn State football beat every day. I went back to Penn State in 2009 as um, an editor at the alumni magazine, and I freelanced football games, and I was one of two or three women in the press box covering the Penn State beat all the time. That's hugely disappointing to me, and I don't understand that entirely, that there hasn't been that much change. I meet women like this, and I see us making inroads, but a lot of it's replacing somebody with somebody new rather than a whole other piece of it, and I think that's... Um, you know, I keep coming back to the, the core. We just love sports, and that's why we do it. What, if any, pressure, Diane, did you feel early on being the first female sports columnist? Do you think that they read your words <coughs> any differently? Uh, what perspective you might have had that others did not? What, tell me about that thought process through your days there. When I became the sports columnist in L.A. 1981, uh, women were just beginning to get into sports. There had been a couple of New York uh, women who had gone to court to get entry. I think it was to the Rangers or the Islanders locker room. So it had started. And when I got to L.A. in 1981, I had no trouble getting into locker rooms, most of, lo sorry, most of the locker rooms. Um, but I'll tell you a story or two about two locker rooms that did not want me to get in. Um, I believed at that time that it was up to me to show that I could do this job as well as anyone. And I believed if I had a problem, it was up to me to solve it. My male colleagues weren't running to the editors, help me, help me. I wanted to show that I didn't need that help either. Um, so I developed sort of, I guess what you would call some problem-solving skills, which I can't emphasize enough. I don't care what job you have in, in life, you're going to have problems. It's part of it. You can have problems with everything. And I think one of the elements of success is people who learn how to solve problems. And I don't think enough attention is given to that. But anyway, so I encountered my first problem with the then California Angels, who are now the Los Angeles Angels of, of Anaheim, Anaheim, which I don't even know what that means, but that's who they are. <laughs> Either do they. <laughs> so I would, I didn't know I had a problem because what I would do is I'd get out to the ballpark before the game. I could go in the locker room. I would talk to whoever I needed to. I would go up to the press box. I would watch a few innings. I'd listen to the game on the radio on the way home. And the next day I'd write the column. I wasn't covering the game. Well, now it's 1982. And the Angels are doing really, really well. And there is a series uh, with the Red Sox in Boston, Labor Day series, five games. Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, and a doubleheader on Monday. I said, I'm going. So I went. And the Angels managed to lose all five games. I went in the locker room afterwards. And the first thing you do, as you may know, is you go to the ma manager's office. You speak to him first. There were maybe four or five, six male reporters in Gene Mock, the manager's office. And I walked in. And in the middle of a sentence, Gene Mock just walked out. And the guys are looking at each other. What's going on here? I knew what was going on. So I went around the locker room. I talked to whoever I needed to. And I waited, and after a while, I went back into Gene Mock's office. He was in street clothes. He was by himself. And I said, Gene, did you walk out because of me? And he said, yes, I did. He said, I know that you can be in here, but it makes me sick to my stomach to see a young woman walking around all these naked men. It, it reminds me of my daughter. I can't deal with it. And he started to cry. And I said, look, I understand. I said, my mom did not raise me to do business with naked men. <laughs> <laughs> but here I am. <laughs> and I said, I've got to come in here and talk to you. He says, you can come in, but I'm not talking to you in the locker room. I can't do it. I'll talk to you in the hall. 
we've all heard this. Um, and I said, look, I think you guys are, are heading for the playoffs, and I can't be standing in the hall waiting for you to come out. I need to talk to players. I may need to go in the other locker room. I need to come in and talk to you. And he said, I'm sorry, I will not talk to you in, in my office or in the locker room. OK. So I went home, and somehow I got it in my head that maybe if he got used to me being around, maybe that would change things. So that September, every opportunity I had, I would drive to Anaheim, get there at batting practice. If Mock was standing at the batting cage, I walked up, I stood next to him, hey, you know, how's so-and-so's shoulder, blah, blah, blah. If he was sitting in the dugout, I sat right next to him, you know, what's your lineup? And sure enough, the Angels got to the playoffs. And they were playing um, Detroit, sorry, Milwaukee. Detroit, Milwaukee, they were playing Milwaukee. <laughs> Nope, they were playing Detroit. Sorry, they were playing Detroit. <laughs> I really know my stuff. Um, they were playing Detroit, and um, they won their first two games in Anaheim. They only needed one more. And they ended up losing the next three. And so I walked into the locker room. It was like a tomb. The players were all sitting on stools at their lockers, shoveling spaghetti in their mouth. Nobody was talking. In the middle of the locker room, Gene Mock was holding court with a bunch of male reporters, TV, print. And he saw me walk in. And he said, all right, guys, that's enough. And he starts walking over to me. I thought, here we go. He walked right up to me. He put his arm around my shoulders and he said, now, Diane, what can I do for you? And I thought, yes. <laughs> so I found that by talking to people, I had a, a second experience um, with the Raiders, actually that same year, because they had just moved from Oakland to, to Los Angeles. Um, the first half of that season was a strike. Um, I think they they didn't play the first nine games of the season. So I didn't have a chance to know the Raiders or meet them. And I did call Tom Flores, the, the coach, one day. I said, let's do a column. What's it like to game plan for a game that's never going to happen? And we did the interview. And then at the end, I said, you know what? I said, I have something else I want to ask you about. I said, I'm told I can't come in your locker room. He said, that's right. I said. I need to come into your locker room. He said, Diane, there's no way we're going to let you in the locker room. I'll come out and talk to you in the hallway. Um, and I said, I did the thing my mother never raised me. And then I said, you know, there's, there have been a few lawsuits already. Women always win them. Let's not do that. I said, I really need to come in. And he said, Diane, you don't understand. He said, last year, some of our players picked up two male reporters and threw them in the garbage can. I don't know what they'll do to you. And I said, tell you what, let me come in. If they're really, really mean to me, I'll cry and I'll never come back. But I have to try. <laughs> so he said, all right. He said, first game you want to come down, tell the PR guy in the press box. He'll call down to me. I'll prepare the team. I said, fine. So the day comes, and I walked in. Um, and I was nervous. I didn't know what I was walking into, but I walked in. And the Raiders then, and maybe to this day, were the only team I'd ever encountered where they didn't have their names over their lockers. And by the time they let the reporters in, they've already stripped off their jerseys. So I didn't know who any of these people were. And I, I walked in, and this very, very large lineman walked up to me. And he said, uh, can I help you? And I said, I'm looking for Ray Guy. He was the kicker that kicked the winning field goal. He said, oh, Ray. He says, yeah, his locker's down at the end there. I said, thank you. And I'm thinking, he's probably sending me to the water boy, right? So I got down to the end, and there was a skinny white guy standing there. I said, are you Ray? He said, yeah. I said, oh, OK. Um, the Raiders went on to be the best team I dealt with. They were the smartest. They were the funniest. About two or three weeks later, the owner, Al Davis, walked in. He said, Diane, it's good to have you here. You're welcome. Come anytime. So um, I think what I'm trying to say to you is that 
rather than running to an editor and saying, oh, you know, they won't let me in the locker room, the editor doesn't need your problems. And I've always found, and I usually won, I, I found that if I could handle these things myself, um, not only would it help me, <laughs> uh, but it gives you a really extra good feeling that you conquered this problem. And I also found um, the players. I don't know what kind of experience you guys have had yet, but they like to test you. They test everybody. They test themselves. That's just what they're made of. And so they'll test reporters. And maybe they'll pick on something. If you're a woman, they might go after you that way. I found, I just gave it back to them. They laughed. It, it was over. But understand, too, that they're testing the men. It's not just the women. And I just want to tell a story about a, a reporter that Charlie and I both know. He, he covered the Dodgers for the Herald Examiner beat writer. He was really, really good. Ken Gurnick was his name. And um, he broke stories. He knew everything. And he was slight. He was short. He was thin. And for some reason, I never asked him, but for some reason, the Dodgers called him Mouse. They still do. They, hey, Mouse, over here. And he'd walk over and take out his notebook. Never complained, never said a word. Um, and so men get it, too. And I don't think women should feel particularly picked on. Um, I just felt I always had an answer. I could say something back to them, and that was the end of it. Allison, how much of that story rings true with you? How much has changed in the years that you started first within the Astro organization and now right. with MLB.com? Um, yeah, my first years as a member of the Astros media relations staff, um, so I started traveling with the team actually halfway through my first season because my boss, the Astros were actually building a new ballpark and my boss became a liaison uh, between the team and the new ballpark people. So he sent me on his road trip. So it was just kind of happenstance that I ended up doing that. And so it was very strange. There weren't a lot of women that were traveling with teams at the time. Uh, I wasn't the only one, certainly, though. There were probably, I think there were like four. Um, and so it, I, didn't, I didn't run into any of those problems. Uh, I mean, a couple of like really old official scores in some of these ballparks were not happy uh, that they had to maybe sit next to me, which was really weird. But, um, but the, I was sort of at a transitional time where it was like Haley and I were talking last night. I said, if you have stories about being rejected, about being excluded, about people trying to keep you out, then that's going to be horrifying to me. Because at this point, that should not be happening. And Kaylee really doesn't have any uh, you know, nightmare stories like that. And it's just like fascinating to me to be sitting with you know, two ends of the spectrum. And so I'm kind of right in the middle. But people were, you know, the players were starting to get used to having uh, female PR people, female reporters around. And they, it, they liked it. I mean, in a lot of ways, as a reporter, I was able to get stories that some of my male counterparts couldn't because they would tell me things, and sometimes they weren't even things that I ended up writing, and sometimes they just needed somebody to talk to, because guys sit around and they don't talk. I mean, there's things that are going on in their lives, and, and not everything's so rosy at home all the time, or a, a, a relative is sick, or whatever, and they found their, a comfort level in me to be able to kind of open up, and I, and I did because always Because you were a woman? Yeah, yeah, because uh, they had, um, you know, they kind of had just a different, like, they feel like they can talk to you about things. Um, but I also wanted to go for the human interest side when I was looking for stories. So there's a lot, there's a huge audience that you have of your readership, and it's not just uh, people who want to talk about the balls and the strikes and the runs that were scored and the nuances of the actual game that was played, but there's so many great stories that are outside of that, and I would always go for that. That was the first, that was the best way that I was going to beat my competitors, first of all. Um, but sometimes they'd hear my line of questioning and they'd say, you're writing that? I'm like, Lance Berkman just said he wanted to go and be a baseball coach at the University of Texas, and he went to Rice. Yes, that's a story. Like this is going to make <laughs> University of, or this is going to make the people at Rice like really mad. This is awesome. So, and they didn't like quite see it like that. Um, so I was always going for that. But I was telling a story last night when we were we were chatting that meant the world to me because it was when I was working in media relations starting out. Um, I would answer the phones a lot because I was like the low person in the department. And people just wanted to talk to a man, and they just did. And it would be local reporters calling up with some random question. They just felt more comfortable 
talking to my boss, uh, talking to a coworker, and I could answer a lot of these questions. And they were, I mean, I could tell you some of the questions. They were so silly, and it was like some statistical thing that I could look up, but they just weren't that comfortable. So um, during spring training, the Astros were uh, like down the road from the Tigers, pretty much, uh, keeping that in perspective. Everything was all spread apart, but the Astros and Tigers played each other a lot. And Ernie Harwell uh, was their very veteran broadcaster, extremely famous in baseball, um, had been around for 50, 60 years at the time, and like the kindest man mm -hmm. you could ever meet. And I was like 26, 27, and I'm standing on the field during batting practice, and he comes up to me, and he says, uh, hello, Allison, I'm Ernie Harwell. Like, he has to introduce himself. I'm like, I know who you are, Mr. Harwell. It's wonderful to see you. And we had never talked before, but he just needed, like, basics of what was going on with the Astros because he was about to broadcast a spring training game that didn't really matter. He just wanted the, what bullpen guys are here, you know, what, who's, the, who are, who's up for jobs and starting rotation, just basic things. And I was, like, feeling like a million bucks because nobody had ever come to me for this information. Um, I was like a last resort. And we chatted. And the next time, he would introduce himself to me again. Um, and then we would have another conversation. So that's the regular season. And the interleague play was still in uh, its infant stages. And the, and the Tigers were in Houston. They were still in the Astrodome. And he comes bolting into the dining room. And he's about to go on the air. And he comes up to me. And he says, do you remember the date of the first night game at Wrigley. I said August uh, 8, 8, 88. August 8, 1988. But it was a rain out, so it was actually the next night. He said, thank you. And he runs back out. And I was like, there are 15 people in this room right now who could have probably given him that information. But he came to me. And, um, and so that, like, it's been 17 years. It will always stand out in my mind because he, th this is one of the most renowned, established, people and voices in our game. Um, and he made, and he doesn't even, he didn't know what it meant to me. Um, but when you're constantly passed over as somebody who doesn't really know enough to justify asking a, a question, like one of the questions one of the reporters called up and said, and this is like before what the internet is now, by the way. Um, so you couldn't just Google stuff. Um, <laughs> I, need to, I know I'm gonna antiquate myself, but that's, so they actually have to call the PR staff for information. And somebody who was trying to remember like all the things that count as a plate appearance, but not as an at bat, walks, hit by pitch, sack, you know. I mean, literally, they're just like, is Rob there? Oh, no, he's at lunch. Is Daryl there? Like, can I just take a stab at this question? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, uh, but as a reporter, and I had hazarded a history with the Astros, so when I moved to the reporting side, it was a very natural transition, and, um, and the, play, you know, the Astros players were notoriously kind people um, and great to work with, and um, it was a great run. I do want to tell just one more story because it just blew my mind. So Jeff Kent, who <laughs> was um, a guy that like everybody who's actually like, familiar with him laughs because he was uh, ornery and he was mean like on purpose. Um, he just didn't, he came there to play baseball, he came there to win baseball games, he was a phenomenally talented player, he played for the Astros for two years, and he just came in there wanting you to know that he's not here to make friends with you, and he's just here to win a World Series. Um, it turned out to be kind of an act, like he was actually like a nice guy, and I told him, I'm like, I'm going to out you as a nice guy if you're not careful, and he kind of would laugh and then scowl and walk away. So the Astros lose, um, they lose game seven of the NLCS in 2004 which they lost the World Series the next year, but the, the NLCS loss was the most devastating loss for them, um, much more than losing the World Series. And you walk in the clubhouse and it's just silent. And guys are devastated. There were a lot of veteran players on that team. They knew that their time was running short and they're trying to win a World Series. There's Jeff Bagwell, Craig Biggio, I mean, some really big names. Um, and it's just dead quiet. And Jeff Kent, his contract is up. And so we're all just kind of standing around like, hmm, who are we going to go talk to? And I see him like signaling for me to come up. Like, I'm like, oh my god. So I went over. He goes, I just want you to know you are the most professional person that I've ever worked with on the reporting side. And I really appreciate you. And whatever happens from here on out, I just want you to know that it was noticed and 
I'm glad we had a chance to work together. <laughs> I was like, I mean, this is the most devastating time, like this 10 minutes, and that he went out of his way to say that, um, you know, meant something to me. So those Jeff, are things that stick Jeff out. Jeff Kent had a veneer of cranky, but he was also <laughs> one of the toughest players I've ever been around, and also one of my favorites, so I can and completely understand. Totally nice guy, too. Jeff that Kent. was all a facade. He is a really, really nice person. Years before you had the little plugs for your phone and would listen to the music, he had uh, whatever, whatever they call those things, pre-iPhone, and he had, had headsets on, but he didn't have anything attached to the headset. <laughs> so he would walk by, and he didn't want to be bothered, but he, he was one of my favorite players, and, and I'm so glad you brought him up. So Kelly, here you are now, listening to these stories from the Museum of Natural History. <laughs> to, how do you wrap your arms around what you've heard in relation to how you go about your business today? Is it considerably easier than some of the stories? You, do you have any interferences along the way? Any hurdles? Well, what I want to say first is thank you to both of you for being the professionals that you are and for setting a standard that we're all trying to meet now because what I have learned is that this is such a business of relationships. And I don't have any stories of being shunned or shut out. I also don't spend time in locker rooms. In my role as a sideline reporter, my job is done about two minutes after the game is over because I get that live interview, we're on the air and then we're off and I'm done. Um, and if I'm doing a, a feature story, obviously that's a very different setting early in a week and away from the action of the game. Um, but to hear the stories of these relationships being built and the respect that both Allison and Diane have earned, that's what resonates with me. Because I have had those experiences where I don't think about the stories I can't get because I'm a woman. I think of the stories I can get because of who I am. Regardless, male or female, I was not an, I'm not an athlete. I have zero athletic ability. I didn't play the game of football or basketball or baseball, the three sports I primarily cover. So I recognize that, that there are cases where, like I had an idea for a feature story on this fellow Pete Jenkins, a 75 year old guy brought out of retirement, one of the most respected defensive line coaches in college football, Ed Ogeron, who now is the interim head coach at LSU. For the football team, this guy is his mentor. He was the second call he made after he called his wife to tell him that he got the job. And I was like, I've got to learn more about Pete Jenkins and why so many folks in this industry, in, this, in, in the game of football, look up to him and what makes him so good. But the fact was, my colleague, Marcus Spears, who played at LSU under Pete Jenkins and then played for the Cowboys for 10 years, like, he played for Pete. His perspective on that feature story would be different from mine and I thought more valuable. So while I had the idea, I gave it to a producer and said, here's my idea, but I think Marcus is best suited for it. You know, but the other side of that is the fact that, and going to the, the human interest piece you were talking about, Allison, a year ago, Derrick Henry was one of the biggest stories in college football, of course, went on to win the Heisman. And the best story about Derrick Henry was the relationship with his grandmother, a woman who raised 15 children, and how that relationship helped shape who he is. And that, for me, was a story that I thought I was best suited to tell. So all that being said, it goes back to it being a business of relationships and who's best suited it to tell a certain story, I think. And when I hear both Allison and Diane talk about those moments where you see the respect earned, those are special moments that you don't forget because you know the work you've put in to build that reputation as an individual, not just as a woman, but as, as a reporter, as someone in this industry. And just this past weekend, I was covering the Ole Miss Texas A&M football game. Story of the game was that Ole Miss's star senior quarterback had been injured the week before, and their head coach, Hugh Freeze, was making the choice to burn the red shirt off of a true freshman and play him. Well, Ole Miss, like a lot of schools out there, which I think this trend was started by Nick Saban, um, they do not allow true freshmen to be interviewed. Oh, and, no, that's Joe Paterno. That's oh, that's where it starts, Paterno? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, 
So that, that just, it is what it is. And yeah. there's no getting around it. It just, and you understand why coaches, I mean, when they've got the power, why not shut you off from talking to a true freshman that they think, you know, just may have too much on their plate and it's one thing they can take off of it. So why make the freshman deal with the media? Well, the first time I ever interviewed Hugh Freeze, it was my first season working in college football, 2010. He was the offensive coordinator at Arkansas State. And that's a relationship I've worked throughout the course of these years and the ascension of his career to build. And so live interview with him post game, as soon as I say thank you to him, Cam returns, I say, can I interview Shea? Yeah. His true freshman quarterback. And, he, and this kid has just won the game, huge comeback in the fourth quarter. This is the only person anybody cares to talk to. And he just goes, heck yeah, go for it. <laughs> and I took off sprinting 50 yards. And I got the interview, and it was so exciting. I'm the only person to this day, uh, you know, all of four days ago, who has interviewed him. And, and it, the interview was on Sports Center. It was everywhere. And, and I got an email from Hugh Freeze on Sunday. And he said, there are not many people I would have let Shay speak to in that moment, but you were one of the few, and I'm glad you were there for that moment. And I forwarded that email to Bob Schieffer, like almost in tears. <laughs> and, and Bob said, I am so proud of you. He said, this is something, this, this is the reporter you want to be. And it's so true. But all back to the point that it's a business of relationships. No matter if you're a woman or a man, it's, it's on you to build those. And Diane, who is your mentor, like a Bob Schieffer or a, 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 someone who had a significant impact on your early career the way? Ernie Harwell did with Allison. Did you have somebody there? Aha, uh -huh, this is. Not in sports, but in my first job at the National Observer, this was a, an odd newspaper. It was published weekly by Dow Jones. It was the only national newspaper outside of, I think, the Wall Street Journal at that time. And it had amazing writers. And it was like Newsweek or Time and what they, they, they've covered. Um, and so I had three, there were three men that I thought were the best writers, and um, they, they were great. I mean, you know, they, they helped me in that way, but I, I didn't, when it got to sports, I didn't, I just, I picked everybody's brains. Um, and, and I just want to say one thing, and, and, and this knowledge just comes from reading and hearing, not knowing what young uh, women reporters have to deal with. I, I, it, it disturbs me some of the things I still hear, but men were my friends. You know, I hear, oh, women, we have to bond together and do a group and blah, blah, blah. The men hired me. They gave me promotions. They gave me raises. I was always asking for raises, and you know what? I got them. People were <laughs> afraid to ask for raises. I don't know why, but... Um, and, and, and when I was brought to the Herald Examiner, it, it was... We're hiring this big deal New York writer to come in, and there were two columnists already, Mel Derslag and Doug Krikorian, and, and Doug was a number two columnist. They demoted him to the number three. They bring me in. There's one other woman in the department, um, and you know we're paying her a lot of money, blah, 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 not great. But I have to say, there wasn't a single guy in that department that didn't help me if I ask for it. You know, who is this guy? How do I get in touch with that guy? Um, I don't care what they said behind my back. Um, and one guy said to me, one day we were talking, I knew he didn't like me, and I said, you don't like me, do you, Bob? And he said, I don't like you, Diane, but I do respect you. And I said, that's a good compliment. Um, I did make a terrible mistake one day. I was at a Super Bowl and I was hanging out, I see Malcolm Moran here. I was hanging out with New York Times guys and other East Coast writers that I knew. And they all were showing up in jackets and ties and you know, looking pretty good. And I said, the guys I work with, they're the worst dressed. They wear these t-shirts these that the team hands out with mustard stains and they wear <laughs> flip flops. And I get back to LA and the first thing somebody says to me is, oh, you don't think we dress well, huh? The word had traveled. <laughs> but I have to say, I never had trouble with men. And um, I never felt like I wanted to sit around with other women and complain and talk about our problems. The, the one thing I think could be helpful, if these problems exist and if women are very upset by these 
horrible tweets that everybody seems to get. Play act. Get a group together. Go to, go go have a drink. Can you believe this tweet I got today? Have a drink. Laugh about it. Um, but I never thought men were the enemy, and I never thought men stood in my way. So maybe that's different. I don't know. Lori, can I, can I jump in here first? I, I, I was just going to uh, two things. Yeah. One, you know a little something about Joe Paterno, Phi Beta Kappa from Penn State, uh, Kent State, <laughs> Penn State. Uh, <laughs> we were talking about Kent State last night. By the way, Nick Saban, head coach, Alabama. Uh, he was on campus May fourth, nineteen seventy, as a student at Kent State. Now that is the reason. My brain went that away. Put, put some perspective on what we've just heard. Well, there's a lot of things, right? Um, first of all, if you don't have a sense of humor in this business, you're not going to make it. Like right. that's just key. Um, second of all, I want to I want to echo Kaylee is that I'm here because of women like Diane who cleared the path for me. Um, I don't think we as women do a great job of celebrating our history in a way that some other people do. I want the young women I teach to know Diane, to know Christine Brennan, to know the people who came before us. And I try very hard to, to put that out there. To, that's part of our history. It's a major cultural change. It's a really important thing. So I'm really happy to have all that there. And I respect all that. And I'm kind of torn. Um, in my feminist soul on a couple of ways for this, right? When I graduated from college in 1991, I marketed myself as someone who could diversify your sports section, not just because I'm female, but because I told human interest stories and because I like that. And the whole point of diversity, right, is to make you stronger. So if we do everything the way the guys do, there's no point. And if that's, you know, we're supposed to bring different perspectives and different things. So I own that. And I think I've gotten plenty, like Allison, I have plenty of stories that I've gotten because I was the woman who asked them. I think like that's, what? Um, they're, they're the personal ones. I mean, that's, that's what it is. The ones where somebody stands to you and you ask a question that's different than somebody else did. That's, that's, that's the beauty of it. That's how it's supposed to happen. But at the same time, I worry that women have to be the ones who do the human interests. I think women should get to be helmet heads just like men. Um, I think that there's a wide variety of people, and I think if we limit it, that that's, that that's one issue. Um, the other part, I, I, I see this much more now as someone who teaches young women and who come to me with the internet trolls and the bosses who they don't feel like or the other, the coworkers or the bosses who they don't feel like they can dust off because it's a professional contact I need for the future. Even though this guy's texting me on a Friday night, even this guy, though this guy is on my, you know, they don't feel like they can deny this because they want to get ahead in the business. So I would say a couple of things. Individ I'm individualism. I looked out for my career and I'm there. But the fact is that fewer than 15% of the sports journalists in this country are female. That's an incredibly small number for the number of little girls who grew up like us reading, rooting for sports, just like the guys. So I do think there are some, there's something structural. What's in the way? What's, what's does that say about society that so many of us are here who love these sports but don't grow up to do it? And I don't know the answers. All I would say is that you have to find the balance. We talked about that on the first panel. We're talking about it here. So yes. Um, Deal with the problems in your own way. I have a whole, I, all of us have a litany. But the other thing is I do think you should tell your bosses. And I do think that it should be there because change comes from the top. And unless you change the framework, nothing changes long term. There's been tons of individual women who have done amazing work. And it's changing structurally. There are many more opportunities for the young women I teach than there were when I was the young woman being taught. And I think that's great. But I also want to be clear about um, this isn't good enough. I shouldn't have been one or two or three women in the press box in 2009 the same way I was in 1988. And so I just, you know, I don't know what the answer is. I, I'm a journalist. I ask questions. So I think that's part of what I do is that I think we need to keep questioning and keep, um, keep asking those. Allison, I remember when you first became much more engaged in social media. Mm -hmm. And I used to look at you, are you crazy? <laughs> and, and you really became you know, one of the, the forerunners of, of that aspect of, of journalism. How has that progressed? Is it what you 
thought it would be, what you want it to be, and as being a woman in the social media of MLB.com. How, if, are there any things that make it unique? But again, you were one of the first who said, there's a future to this thing, and I thought you were nuts. Yeah, so I left the beat writing job in 2009. The Astros approached me with a social media director position that they had created. Um, basically didn't really know a lot about social media and didn't really want to, but just knew that it was here, it was coming, it looked like a tidal wave and they wanted to get ahead of it. The owner was really proud of himself that he's like, he created the first full-time social media job in baseball, that was important to him. So. Um, so I did that. I did that for three years. Um, at the time, I mean, they just wanted me. It was more of a uh, PR job at that time in this situation, which is unique to what it is now, which is 100% marketing. Um, they wanted me to be with the team all the time. They said, just tweet, um, you know, post your pictures, blog. They wanted me to, I had a blog that was pretty well read, um, and they wanted that to be like out. The, so the Astros were in the process of going this way in terms of being a good team. They no longer were. And it was going to be a while before they were going to be good again. And so they wanted somebody to keep the fans engaged and interested in the team while they were going through this transitional time. And because I had been the beat writer for so many years, the name was familiar to fans, and so it was like an easy transition. So I was with the team constantly. I only missed maybe 10 games a year. Um, I don't know that I could have kept up that schedule forever, but it worked well. And I was traveling with them. Um, and they just basically wanted that kind of engagement. Now what social media is, I mean, you would not find like a full-time uh, social media person for a team actually like going, like traveling with the team. Um, any teams like putting up the expense to, to do that. It's very much marketing. I mean, it, some of them are wonderfully creative and you see a lot of like the team Twitter accounts that are great and, and, and really keep people interested, but it's also definitely like trying to get people to buy tickets and things like that. So um, it's evolved. I mean, I look at it as a very primitive time when I first started started out. Um, it's become, uh, you know, a lot of social media is, of course, we all know just some of the abuse that there is now. Um, you just, it's it's easy to say like, oh, just don't don't let it affect you and just ignore these people. But when you, it's, it's as if someone's screaming like really bad things at you like all day, like to your face. I mean, it's not that much different when you're being called names and um, I've, escapes like the really worst of it um, but uh, other people have have to deal with a lot more um, so th I think there's still a lot of progress that can be made on that front but there's no better way to get the word out of your team than through social media and um, and so in that respect I think it's it's going in the right direction but it's also it's just it's it there's a lot I mean <laughs> The years that I was with the Astros doing their social media, and I like would access the Facebook page like a hundred times a day, and I would erase any um, comments that had foul language in it. I was never a social media director for the Houston Astros when they were good. They were fans were <laughs> mad the entire time, <laughs> and um, I got it toughened me up a lot. Which was, you know, looking back, it was probably a good thing. But I. I'm not going to get into it, but the team got sold and there was like this marketing person that came on and she had no experience in sports and she wanted to treat this like corporate America and she wanted reports on the, what's, what are the fans uh, saying and thinking and she wanted all this analysis. I'm like, it's really simple in our game. You win, they're happy, and you lose, and they're really, really pissed off. And they're mad every day when I come in the morning to, to scan these things. Um, no one's happy. So... Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cut and dried in our industry. Kayla, you're of the social media generation. How does it impact on you, or does it? Do you tweet? Do you listen? What's, what's your perspective of all of that? Well, what's been interesting to me, even just in the last year, how much of a concerted effort ESPN has made to recognize the power of it and how much we all need to be engaged in it, because I've got... This is going to sound, I don't know what, really know what this is going to sound like when I say it out loud. I've got almost 100,000 Twitter followers that I don't really feel like I did all that much. They're only human. To gain. <laughs> to gain. And I, don't, I, don't, I know that I don't personally tweet as much as I should or should. I don't know who's making that measurable. But as, as some other reporters do, I so often think of my job. If I'm working sidelines for a game, I'm worried about the content I'm putting on television. I'm not tweeting injury updates on, I'm just not. I know that for some NFL reporters, 
it's harder for them to get into the broadcast at times. So for them, social media is an outlet during a game to be giving fans more information that they actually can't get into the broadcast. That's not something I've encountered. But going back to ESPN, making so much more of a concerted effort, before every football game I work this season, I have to do a Facebook Live broadcast on ESPN's college football page or SEC Network's college football page, depending on what network my game is on. And, and how many people see it? What, that's what's wild to me. So we were given the statistics in ESPN's college football seminar, ranking engagement on social media sites. And I was shocked to see that Twitter was at nine and Facebook was at one or two. And so they were telling us then, Facebook Live, this is the future, this is where it's at. And I kind of laughed. I mean, Facebook launched when I was in college. And for me, it's still a, I still have my personal page and I don't, I don't really use it to engage with fans or followers. I use Twitter more for that. My Instagram's public. My Snapchat is private for, with friends. But Facebook Live, they were just, this is it. This is, this is where it's going. We'll get 30,000 viewers live on a Facebook Live. I mean, that to me is crazy, but it's true. It's, it's, it really is the, the largest platform with the biggest audience. And we've ended up having a lot of fun with it. And I was skeptical and I was wrong to be that way. But it's, this year has been an, an interesting experiment in the social realm for me, for sure. I took over SportsCenter's Snapchat feed before a football game a couple weeks ago and was getting 40,000 views on, I mean, you know, Snapchat videos are seven seconds long, getting 40,000 views like really quickly. Um, so it's the tagline that we were being told in the college football seminar this year was find your social voice. And it's actually made me reflect more on the moments I get to be a part of that I might take for granted. You know, just the pregame moments that fans cannot have a window into otherwise. And taking over that Snapchat feed for the day was the perfect example of that, where I'm able to walk up to a player pregame and say, hey, show me what's on your pregame playlist. And fans went nuts for it. You know, that's, that's the sort of behind the scenes access that I'm reminded I have the ability to share with people and social media is the place to do that. Well, Ms. Shaw, what do you make of that? <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have to deal with all that. <laughs> <laughs> My form of tweets came to me in angry handwritten letters. <laughs> <laughs> Usually written in pencil. Um, <laughs> in print. Block yes. letter print. And sometimes it had a prison number after the name. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's obviously a whole new world, and there's all, all kinds of extra responsibilities. Um, you know, I, I keep thinking about when I was working, um, if you worked for Sports Illustrated, you had one story a week. And if you worked for a newspaper, you had one, maybe two stories a day at most. Um, and so life apparently was a lot easier for us back then. Lori, uh is this where journalism is going? What is the definition of journalism today as opposed to what it was when I was starting and Diane was starting and some of the fellas? Well, I don't know. If I knew the answer to that, I'd be... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's evolving, right? I mean, it's a... I don't... I don't know what it is. I think it's still the same. It's core. I think it's still the same, is that when journalism is at its best, no matter what we're doing, is that we're telling stories that illuminate who humans are and how our society works, that we're holding people accountable because that's our role. The whole public can't do something. We have to be there. That role happens in sports, too. And I want to point that out. There's domestic violence issues. There are rape issues on college campuses. There are um, health concerns in various leagues. There are concussion stories. There are lots of other things that are going on there. So, you know, part of sports is the fun part and the, the Cubs winning it, you know, and, and everything happening. And part of it are these other people, other, other parts of the game that still matter. And I think they still matter. I think the business model is what's changed. I don't know that the journalism model has changed very much. There's just a different tool, right? So um, when I started writing, I had a... Um, Radio Shack, a, a Trash 80 computer. Did you have one, Diane? Did yeah. you have one? <laughs> yes, and some, when I teach, I pull it up on the screen to show people. And it's got, um, it's about that big, it's, um, and it has four lines, 
four <laughs> screen lines on it. And you sent stories with acoustic couplers, which were these wow. torture devices that were developed by somebody. And you had to jam the, a phone, like a real phone, with like a, like a headset and a and handset. And a screeching and sound. And a screeching sound. You pushed it in there, and it made this loud screeching noise. And you crossed your fingers. Yeah. And usually it didn't get there. And then you had to dictate it to nice. some overworked copy editor. <laughs> And then you would get it in the paper the next morning and realize that they didn't capitalize anything because they didn't have time before they sent it, right? So, you know, it's the same thing, but the tool changed. So now one of the tools is social media, and now it's Snapchat, now it's whatever else it is. So I think the core principles remain the same, that it's about relationships, it's about people, it's about illuminating things, and now we have all these other tools to do it, and I think that's what makes it complicated. And you know, I want to say one note about the social media. I know a young female reporter who was reporting on social media from an event which she was told to do. It was a news event that was happening. There was a high profile athlete who was involved in it. She tweeted that along with everything else and it got to the point where her news organization had to get people to walk her back to her apartment and stay there yeah. because she was getting threatened by fans. And that's different. I mean, I'm not from the age, you know, I got bad letters and I got some bad emails for a while, <laughs> um, you know, but I didn't have this social media pressure. That's real. And that's a different level of what you have to deal with. Nobody could send me a letter or send me even an email back in the day and I had to worry about somebody walking me home. But that was a very real danger for this young woman. So I don't want to, you know, that goes out there. And that's not that it's not happening to men too, but there's, you know, there is a greater danger for women in that situation, and I think we have to realize that. I don't have any answers. I also feel like I'm kind of like the cranky person on the panel, like, oh, here's the, like, you know, like, here's the big, per you know, here's all the fun stuff, and then here's the big pictures, and they go together, right? Like, no, okay, cool, thank you. <laughs> yes, and I, I own cranky, believe me. Like, I, you know, so, I mean, I see this from a lot of levels now. I see this as somebody who's done the job for a long time and who teaches it and who mentors now. And so I just have this very weird perspective and I'm kind of in the middle of it all and now you're listening to me sort it all out. <laughs> what do you think, Allison? Because I, I, I just preface it, I, I, Allison asked if I would do a Facebook Live thing. Oh, that's right, you're one of our Facebook Live people. Yes, yeah. wow, I, um, I was with you and Jeff Nelson. Right, so Jeff Nelson. Um, and, and I was astonished at the reaction. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to do Alice in a favor. We'll sit right. and chat for 15 minutes, and then all of a sudden, there is this this reaction. And a there's nothing more unnerving than Facebook Live uh, when you are working and you don't get a do-over. I had a very embarrassing moment <laughs> where I drew a blank as soon as we started. It was with Jim Deshays, actually, um, who's like one of my oldest and dearest friends. So that was really weird. Why I just like totally drew a blank when I was with him. Um, but we started the Facebook Live, and then I was like, okay, wait. And I said a word that I shouldn't have said. And I was like, oh, my God, this was live. So they're, they're scrambling, and they're oh, deleting. Oh, shit, it was live, huh? That's exactly okay. what I said, actually. And, um, <laughs> and it was mortifying. Uh, so Nobody saying, says, oh, my God. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff Nelson, who's like a, he's got four World Series rings with the Yankees, and uh, Jim Deshays, who's a Cubs broadcaster, and myself, and... Um, anyway, so, but Facebook Live was a huge part. I covered the entire postseason. I was on the Cubs uh, series for the NLCS and the World Series. Um, and so we did Facebook Live chats and we had to find guests. And so I leaned on all of my friends. And yeah, it, 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 media day. Um, so the day before the World Series starts and they have like a media day. Uh, and they just had me with a microphone and they were following me around and we were doing Facebook Live. And the whole time I'm thinking, I need to be entertaining. I need to be, you know, kind of like flippant, and you're just sort of going around from table to table, and the guy, the players are all talking. But you can't mess up. This is not anything that you can take back. And they're sitting there, on their phones, at their computers, and they're watching this um, live. So, having a little more preparation time, probably. They're watching you they're, come to them. Yeah, it was like, and the camera was following me at media day, and all this <laughs> huge thing of red hair like I'm like oh my god I was watching it later I'm like don't ever do that again it was kind of mortifying just to see me on the back of me on camera like that but um, but yeah it was uh, it was good though I mean it, you know that's what people are watching and um, we had some really good guests Len Casper I don't think he's here yet but he was one of our guests yeah. and Charlie and uh, and that's the way that's the way of the world we were outside Wrigley Field just talking to fans doing live stand-ups just whatever we could get and um, you know there's no cutting and editing and, and anything anymore, just straight up live. Well, and just to follow that up, a couple weeks ago, we did one of our most 
watched Facebook Lives before an Ole Miss football game. I work with Brent Musburger, who's my play-by-play -play guy, which is just an incredible honor. But Brent had never been to Oxford, Mississippi to call an Ole Miss football game before. In his long and wonderfully successful career, he'd never been. So we went to the Grove, and we just started Facebook Live as soon as we got out of the golf cart, and Facebook Live just followed us around to experience Brent's first experience in the Grove. And we, we provided zero content. I mean, I wasn't giving you any fun facts about this football game that was coming up. I don't even think we, aside from hearing some War Eagle chants by Auburn fans, <laughs> you know, you did, we weren't talking about the matchup. It was just a, join us for the experience. And that, I think, is what you have to think of it as, is this additional tool yeah. to give folks another viewpoint on something that otherwise, you know. It's all about behind the scenes access. Yeah. That's how the social media job started in 2009. It's like, just show everybody what they can't see and keep them engaged that way. It's all about behind the scenes. I think we've got about three or four minutes left. And one of my favorite columns that I've ever read uh, came from Diane uh, in the early 80s, I guess it was, with Steve Carlton. Steve Carlton was notoriously cranky. He wouldn't talk to anybody about anything. And these days, he lives inside of a rock. <laughs> he does up in Colorado, and he's afraid that uh, Martians or somebody are going to come get him. <laughs> True. And Diane decided to write a column about Steve Carlton who was terminally unavailable for comment. Tell us about the column, what you said, what made you think to come up with that wonderful story that <laughs> we'll always remember. Well, I think it began in 1980. I was covering uh, the World Series, and he was there. Um, I think he won game seven, and he Charlie's right, he wouldn't talk to reporters. He was a real jerk. Um, <laughs> we have some of those. And after the game, uh, we were in the locker room, and he was in a, a, a glass-enclosed room with the door closed. And he had, I keep forgetting, Dickie, maybe it was Dickie Knoll, some flunky that followed him around. <laughs> and they're in there, and I'm standing outside of this with some of the most revered sports writers of the day. There was Pete Axelm from Newsweek. There was Red Smith, who was about 82 at the time from the New York Times, but sharp as ever. It, Jim Murray might, might have been there from the LA Times. Um, maybe Steve Wolf from Sports Illustrated. I, anyway, the, there were four of us standing there. And Steve Carlton finally decided he was going to come out of this room. And he sent this flunky opened the door, threw a bucket of water on us. And I remember Pete had this beautiful suede jacket on and, you know, red, I mean, and then he scampered down the hall out of sight. Okay, three years later, the Phillies came to, to play the Dodgers in the, in the playoffs. And I, I don't, I can't tell you what made me think of this, but I wrote a column in which I reversed roles. Um, he had, he had already won 300 games. He went into the Hall of Fame. So I started my column by saying, you know, I've just uh, surpassed 300 columns, which puts me in company with 17 other columnists. And um, it's so annoying because these ball players keep calling me, wanting me to interview them. <laughs> and then I had Steve Carlton. Hello, uh, Ms. Shaw, this is Steve Carlton. I wondered if you would have some time to interview me today. And <laughs> I said, well, who are you with? <laughs> well, I'm with the Phillies. I said, OK. Um, I said, uh, I probably don't have time. And he said, well, maybe I could take you out for a cup of coffee or lunch. I said, I don't let my personal life interfere with my work life. <laughs> and he said, um, well, I could see you at the ballpark. And I said, well, let me think. I uh, get to the ballpark two and a half hours before the game, go up to the press box. First, I have to plug in my, my word processor. They were plug-in days back then. First, I have to find a plug and plug it in. And then I have to take the top off of the word processor. And then I have to do some finger exercises to make sure everything's going to go well. 
And he said, well, maybe when you're done with that. And, and I said, well, no, no, then I go down to the batting cage. There are other sports writers I haven't seen for a while. We tell the best jokes, and I can't miss that. <laughs> and I said, and then I have to go into Tommy Lasorda's office. I want to check out the food and the celebrities that are there. <laughs> And then I have to run through the Dodgers locker room and say hi to everybody. I'm a hometown writer. They expect me to be nice to them, so I do that. And so I, I carried out this conversation for a while, and he's begging me. He said, you know, couldn't, you know. And I said, okay, I have an idea. I think, I'll, what if I send an intermediary to interview you? I'll send Vin Scully. <laughs> he will interview you. He'll give the tape to Steve Brenner, the PR guy. He'll pull out the best quotes, and I can write about that. And he said, he said, oh, you would do that? That would be great. And uh, thank you so much. I said, sure. And I said, by the way, what was your name again? <laughs> and that was the column. <laughs> I don't know that he read it, and I'm sure it didn't care. He didn't care, but it was fun to do. <laughs> of course, it was a mythical Steve Carlton. I'll, I'll close it with, with this mini anecdote about Carlton, a few years ago, uh, some fella comes up to me at Dodger Stadium. He does a local show in Carolina, and on weekends he does stuff for the CBS radio network. And I generally don't like doing sports talk shows because generally it's the, uh, it's the agenda of the host and not necessarily what the guest has. They, they're looking for those gotcha quotes. So I generally have uh, shied away from them unless it's a, a friend of mine. So this fella comes up to me, and I'm talking with Steve Yeager at the time on the field. And, Hi, I'm from North Carolina. I'm on Monday through Friday, but on weekends I'm on the CBS uh, radio network, and we would love to have you come on the air. And I said, uh, I, I don't do that stuff anymore. I'm kind of like a, a Steve Carlton. And he said, <laughs> Carlton doesn't do radio? <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>